I wanted to check out a few Linux distributions today to try to help people make a decision as to which ones they might want to try. Uh, I'm not going to put on, you know, I'm not going to tell you which is the best of the nine, but rather help let you make a decision on your own. It, a Linux distribution is a personal thing. I mean, you have different needs than I do. And if for me to say, oh, this is the best Linux distribution, first of all, my view of Linux distribution is going to be tainted by the experience that I have with it. And so that's probably not going to help you very much. You'll probably end up in a Linux distro that you don't really want to start out with. The second thing is, is that some of the Linux distros are better than others for uh, specific day-to-day -day tasks. For example, some are better at photography and video and music than others. Some are better in development and in, and in certification. So some are also better if you're a security professional or, or maybe you're just a home user that wants to use it to do banking and then a little bit of surfing online with the, the web or your social media applications. So there's a whole slew of things that you have to consider, but you need to look at what you're using Linux for. Do I think that 2023 is the year of the Linux desktop? No, <laughs> no, no, of course not. Uh, but I am trying to help you if you are trying to figure out where you should go in Linux. So let's get started here and, uh, and let's talk about this a little bit. Linux can be a very rewarding experience. I mean, it's, uh, there are pitfalls. I won't lie to you. There are pitfalls. There are places that you will, you'll find that you may need help. And nobody wants to hear the, hey, what are you asking us for all these stupid questions? Why don't you read the manual? Usually it's got some expletive in there as well, but nobody wants to hear that. Or, or worse, you idiot, you should be using Linux distro XYZ, not the one you picked. I don't know how many times I've heard people say that to others. I mean, uh, your choice is going to be unique to theirs. And so per, uh, somebody that says you're using the wrong one has no clue about how, what you really need. Only you can answer that. So that's the purpose of today is to try to explain that to you. So Linux itself is really a collection of things. So whenever somebody refers to Linux by itself, they're usually referring to a distribution. However, in, in Linux proper, the, the, Linux is actually the kernel or the piece of the operating system code that controls your hardware manages your applications, schedules your processor for work, all those kinds of things. And there is always a shell that accompanies Linux that is your, uh, it can be a, a text-based interface into the kernel. And then there's usually some graphical user interface that allows it, allows you to have an easier uh, time of trying to, of being able to manage your Linux distribution launch applications, install new applications, or remove old ones that you don't want anymore. So all of this makes up what we call a Linux distribution. It's the kernel, the shell, the graphical user interface, although if you're running on a server, you probably won't have that. But then, and also there'll be utilities, compilers, uh, yeah, it, it, whatever else you need in order to complete uh, your view of the operating system environment. So how many Linux distributions can we choose from? Uh, there's well over 450 of them. Uh, so yeah, I don't think I want to go through all those today. And besides, some of them are really very slight differences from others. And so they're generally, some of them are are they didn't like the way that the uh, originator or the one that they base their distribution on is doing things. They didn't like the direction they were going to. So they created their own version of the Linux distro from uh, their base, their original base, and then modified it. So, but you don't need to be concerned with all that. That's not important. What is important as a beginner to Linux you'll need a, your first distro to be, this is how I'm going to, to evaluate them. It needs to be simple to install. If you look at your Windows or Mac environment, you don't have to do anything other than plug it in, turn it on, and it comes up. So, yeah, I mean, once you buy a new piece of hardware, there isn't, you, you don't have the experience of having to install an operating system. In Linux, you do. 
However, there are a number of hardware vendors today that offer a Linux distribution with your hardware, so you don't have to go through that install. The second thing is it needs to be understand, easy to understand, and it needs to have documentation that helps you get started, helps you understand what you need to do in order to bring the system up for the first time. And maybe you want to keep your old Windows environment and you don't want to clobber it. So, yeah, as we used to say, clobbering is erasing or deleting your old environment unintentionally. You also need some a good support community, not one that's going to chastise you or tell you, hey, you chose the wrong distro. Um, just ignore those comments because, those, like I said, those people are clueless about what your needs are. And so I would just go like this and just ignore them. It needs to be stable. Uh, and, you know, most For the most part, Linux is very stable, but there are some distributions which are out on the fringes and are exper kind of experimental that you will experience crashes with, but we're not going to cover those today. We're only looking at ones that have been proven over time. We also want pretty good support for the hardware. Now, I can't guarantee you that if you go out and buy a brand new machine today based on the latest Intel or AMD chips that you're going to have good support in Linux because it just it lags behind. We don't have in in this community in Linux we don't have a a plethora of vendors that create drivers for us. We have to do that, and in order for that to happen, we basically have to revert, reverse engineer what those developers of say Nvidia's graphics card or maybe a Qualcomm Wi-Fi chip. But we don't, the Qualcomm doesn't do that for us. Intel doesn't do that for us. Although Intel is a member of the uh, Linux Foundation and they do contribute lots of code to the Linux kernel, they, you'll still find that you have drivers that, that just won't work out of the box because we don't have them in the Linux kernel yet. So you'll usually find that those are going to lag between two and six months behind your hardware. So you're better off if you're coming to Linux for the first time, pick up your old laptop or your old machine and use it to install Linux. That's, don't get too old. Uh, but yeah, well, we'll I'll explain that. Don't get, I mean, if you got machines that are older than 15 years old, I'm not gonna guarantee those are gonna work. We also want it to look pretty good and so that we don't have to go in and customize the way the look and feel is put together. Uh, in order to be able to get it to look the way we want it to look. Uh, also, it might be good to have it play some supported games, uh, being able to access video, maybe I'll be able to get to your favorite social media sites and so forth and use it. Uh, but <clears throat> don't worry, you don't have to be a computer engineer or a systems programmer in order to use Linux. It's gotten to the point, I don't think it's ever really been like that. It's always, in the past, Linux was considered a hobbyist OS. Uh, and because it was mainly because people were tired, like myself, was tired of the commercial versions of operating systems and wanted to get away from that. Yeah, because you were always tied to the direction they wanted to go. And, and that wasn't what I wanted to do. So I have, I've got a list of Linux distributions I put together. And I, like I said, these are in no particular order other than they're in alphabetical order and that's it. I am not going to tell you which one you should use. I'm going to help you choose the right one for you. I can't, I mean, I, I can't tell you which one you would use because I have no clue as to what your background is and what you're intending to do with Linux. So, or your, what you use your computers for, more importantly. So the first one we're going to look at today is Elementary OS. I think Elementary OS is really best known as a Linux distro uh, that has good aesthetics. This is great look and feel, right? I mean, it, it looks beautiful. Uh, and it is also uh, very well known for its stability. Uh, Elementary's user interface is inspired from the Mac OS. So if you're coming from the Mac OS environment, you won't find it completely familiar, but it'll be familiar enough that you'll be able to pick it up and start using it. Uh, Elementary OS is based on Ubuntu, and Ubuntu is probably one of the largest Linux distributions that's out there in terms of the number of copies that are out in the world and being used. 
Uh, but they, uh, we'll talk more about Ubuntu later, but Ubuntu has a long-term support edition, which is supported for, I think, up to five years. Uh, and that allows uh, elementary to pull in security and bug fixes for the next five years after Ubuntu announces like a new release of their baseline. Elementary will then pick that up. So elementary is famous really for its app center. Uh, it has an application center that is loaded with curated applications, uh, and they're designed around what their user base feels are the needs of their daily use. So you'll find a lot of really well-designed applications that are designed for people that are just doing everyday things. Also, it, does, it uses a very unique desktop. Uh, its graphical user interface is quite different than most others. And that is based on Pantheon's desktop. So, yeah, there, there's a few Pantheon desktop uh, out in the wild, but uh, Elementary chose that as their flagship. So, what are some of the, so here's, here's the list, the pros and cons. So, the pros of Elementary OS is that Pantheon's desktop is beautiful. Uh, it's, it provides a good mix of aesthetics and power. So they balance the, as you, you know, as you add eye candy, you're reducing the power of the machine because you're offsetting what gets done uh, by your graphics card, maybe by the CPU and the machine itself. So they balance the, the look and feel with the amount of t uh, power that it's using off the machine so that you get the best experience that they can, they can curate for you. Uh, it has a very large collection of curated applications, and it is it, it is designed with touchscreens in mind. So if you have devices that are touchscreen based, you'll find that Elementary is probably a good choice for that. The cons: you're going to find that Elementary is kind of heavy on system resources, and it may require more modern hardware than some of the others. Uh, also, you'll find that it does use more memory. Uh, than other Linux distros. I mean, the next one is Linux Mint. So Linux Mint comes in three flavors or three editions, as they call them. Uh, and those offer different desktop environments. They offer Cinnamon Edition, which is offering a very similar interface to Windows. Uh, probably Windows 7 would be the closest uh, look and feel. It doesn't look anything like Windows 11, of course. Uh, there's also Mate. Mate is one of the older... Uh, GNOME versions of a desktop user interface, and Mate is known for uh, being very lightweight and yet maintain a pretty good look and feel. XFCE takes that uh, lightweightness even a step further uh, to, to try to, to take less amount of resources off your system while providing a decent uh, user interface, but there are, you'll have to customize it to really make it look better then what it does coming out of the box, I can tell you that. So uh, Linux Mint, because it's based on Ubuntu, also has five years of support uh, for security and bug fix. The pros of Linux Mint, they have a very user-friendly community and they have good support through that community. Uh, it is a, it's time-tested. Uh, Linux Mint has been around for quite a number of years. Uh, and it, it is time tested to work as a dual boot with Windows. So, yeah, you, you'll have very few problems dual booting, even off the same drive, which I don't recommend uh, with Windows. Uh, also, it has good documentation. So if you need help uh, and you want to read the manual, you can. Uh, and it is written for everyday users, not for system engineers or computer en hardware engineers. Uh, it is a uh, it is offering a legacy uh, as well as new hardware support. So you can use older machines with Linux Mint. Uh, it is lightweight in nature, and the preloads are, are it preloads many useful applications as well. You'll find that Linux Mint is when when people refer to beginners OS distributions on Linux, you kind of think of oh, this is a place to get started, but not where I will end up. Well, Linux Mint is powerful enough that you, it can grow with you. So you can become as advanced as you want it to be. There's really no need to have to leave and go to another Linux distro unless you really want to. 
as far as cons, there is it isn't really an eye candy desktop, but some people would say that eye candy equates to having you're losing power off of your CPU or your graphics card because something's got to draw all those beautiful images, right? So this the second thing is the legacy desktop layout. Uh, and that has to do with the menu and the icons don't always look so great. Uh, yeah, you can you can go in and you can tweak them and you can you can change and you can customize them, but that takes a little bit of learning on your part to do it. MX Linux, it is a good choice for beginners because it brings a complete Linux distribution with a pretty decent user interface. It has a good selection of applications which are pre-installed. You get that, I just want this out of the box to work. I want to be able to use the applications that I need, and I don't want to have to learn to do anything else. MX Linux offers two years of active support, active support being uh, patches and, and bug fixes. Also, they offer two additional years beyond that active support for security fixes for a total of about four years or so of support. The pros for MX Linux is it has the support for two for about four years in total. Uh, it also has a wide range of hardware support. So if you have a lot of different kinds of devices you're hooking up, like Thunderbolt and some of those kinds of things, uh, you might find it more stable on MX Linux than you would in others. Although I have found that uh, Debian and Ubuntu both work fine for Thunderbolt today wasn't quite so true back in 22 or 2004 uh, yeah it was kind of iffy with the thunderbolt back then the problem was in the linux kernel not in the distribution though yeah that would lock up every once in a while after a reboot uh, and required a power down of the thunderbolt but that's no longer the case uh, it is uh, mx is considered stable and fast and it comes with as i said the preloaded application some of the cons though is it is, you know, it's based on an of Debian, and it does have older packages in it that for certain applications. So you may, if you're comparing it to other Linux distros, find MX Linux lagging behind a little bit. But you're going to find that a lot with Debian because Debian backports security patches into the same version number. So uh, that isn't always a good measure of determining whether or not a package is out of date or not. Also, it is not, I mean, I wouldn't consider MX Linux to be a beautiful desktop interface. It's just, but you may, you may. I don't, but you may. Uh, I'm including Peppermint OS in this one because I have a personal affinity for it. I like it. Uh, Peppermint OS comes in two distributions. One is based on Debian and the other is based on Dev1. Uh, the difference between the two is subtle. Uh, yeah, it's not important uh, for your choices. However, I mean, if you're starting out new and you want to use Peppermint OS, uh, and the version that you'll run into is 11. Peppermint appeals to new and experienced users alike. So uh, again, it's one of those Linux distributions that you can put on and, and keep going. The philosophy behind uh, Peppermint 11 is that it, it, they don't make any predisposed uh choices for you as to what applications are installed. They don't even install a browser. So you can choose whatever applications or whatever browser support you like and build up the system the way you want. And you don't have all this other cruft from applications that you would never use installed out there in the first place. The pros. It looks, it looks great, uh, I think. Uh, you might be put off by the welcome screen that comes up initially, but you can get rid of that. I know that's turned away some people when they first have seen that. But uh, yeah, you kind of need to understand how it works, and that's why they put it there is to kind of help, help you. The other thing that you'll find with the Peppermint OS people is they are very friendly uh, and, and very helpful in their user forums. I, I, I don't know if I have ever seen someone say, uh, read the manual or you're using the wrong OS in, the, in those forums. They seem to want to take the time to understand what your problem is and try to help you with it. But understand it's just people like yourself that are trying to help others that maybe you're a little further along and understand things a little bit better than 
than, than the person you're trying to help. It is lightweight on resources. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't take a lot of uh, resources. And as a result, Peppermint OS in my test has always been one of the fastest Linux distros out there. It is far faster than Ubuntu. Uh, and it is far it is far faster than Debian upon which it is based. So yeah, and it comes uh, it comes with a variety of very helpful applic- uh, tools to help you get started and learn more about it. The cons, if you're on newer hardware, you may struggle a bit, but that's true of any Debian release, uh, and that's just mainly because Debian doesn't they only put out a new kernel. Uh, in their machines about once every two to three years. There have been longer stints on Debian, but uh, yeah, usually it's two to three years. So again, it's not important for you, but just remember if, you, if you're trying to bring the latest hardware, Peppermint OS and Debian OS are probably not gonna be good choices for you. The other one is Pop OS. Pop OS has been gaining a lot of attention, particularly in the last couple of years. It is a Linux distribution from a hardware manufacturer called System76. System76 makes its own line of computers all the way from laptops up to servers and workstations. Uh, it, it was originally, Pop! OS was originally meant to support the System76 hardware, but as we all found out, it also supported other uh, vendors' hardware as well. And in fact, both AMD and Lenovo have... Uh, have options that you can install. Uh, you can have Pop! OS pre-installed on some of the laptop models that they sell. Pop! OS is noted for its uh, ability to handle graphics workloads. Also, if you're doing artificial intelligence or machine learning development, Pop! OS is a good environment for that. And of course, uh, they're, they're becoming more, I mean, they're great fans of the Rust programming language. And so, you will find a lot of projects that are going on inside of System76 that is using Rust as their development language. And they use it for a lot of their utilities. They're building Cosmic in it, which is their, uh, uh, their replacement for the, the uh, GNOME desktop. They also have the, uh, the Pop Shop, which is based on Elementary's App Center. For some of the pros and cons, uh, they have, I mean, Cosmic is kind of, I don't think it's a finished work yet, uh, but it, they, it, they're pushing new parts of it out as they do subsequent releases. So Cosmic is a well-designed desktop. It's, it's somewhat cartoony, but it's, it, it works really well. I, I mean, this is just my opinion. They also offer built-in support for NVIDIA graphics cards, whereas most distros you can struggle a little bit trying to get the NVIDIA graphics cards installed because of the way NVIDIA supports Linux, which is kind of like this, kind of at, hand, at arm's length. They uh, they don't, I mean, they're trying to open source some of their drivers. Some of that work is being pushed back into the Linux kernel, but they haven't opened it up enough where it's a complete standalone environment. So, yeah, if you're installing to support NVIDIA on other Linux distros, uh, it can be a chore because you have to know a little bit about how to shut, how to bring your system up into single user mode. And yeah, it just NVIDIA just, they don't care about Linux. And so they make it as difficult as possible for us, it seems. That's just an opinion. It's of course Pop OS is available to purchase with hardware. So if you're you're buying systems from System76, it comes with them. Uh, and as I mentioned, that there are machines from HP and Lenovo in the laptop market which come pre-installed with Pop OS instead of Windows. You'll find that Pop OS is a bit heavier on system resources now. They're trying to address some of that. I noticed that Cosmic has gotten better in the newer releases of it from the resource uh, requirements that it had on previous releases. But it's still, you'll find that, I mean, they may not even be important to you. You may not even care. It's not noticeable. It's just that it may take some more memory over what another distribution might take. I'm going to include, I don't see too many people include OpenSUSE 
in their in their evaluations of beginners OS. But I think it, it is a good one. I is often excluded from this list, which I really find odd because SUSE as a distribution was one of the first ones that was available back in the nineties. I mean there was there was only a handful of distributions. So SUSE goes way, way back. And they have the support, uh, just like Red uh, Fedora does, from a larger portion of the company, which generates revenue. So they, like Red Hat, SUSE has a, a version of their operating system, which is used in commercial environments that you buy a subscription to. And that revenue stream helps support the open source side. Uh, or the open side, uh, it, it isn't that those versions aren't open source, they are, but that the the what they would free to use, I guess, would be a better way of putting it. Leap, there's two there's two variations of OpenSUSE. First is Tumbleweed. That's a little bit like Arch in that it is a rolling release, so you don't have a formal release of Tumbleweed. You just pick up the ISO it's a snapshot in time, and then as packages are released and updated, you get them at the same time or as close to the release and available uh, availability date as possible. So Leap is a more traditional release model. They're currently at 15.4, I think, and, uh, and that is, okay, so we're going to package all this together and then we're going to put it out there as an ISO and you can install it. You can maintain it, of course. You can get newer packages as they are released, but the release cycles are a little slower. Uh, they, don't, they don't occur as soon as uh, the package is released. They actually do some testing on it first to make sure it's not going to cause some kind of uh, problem on your machine. I wouldn't recommend Tumbleweed to a beginner. Uh, but oh, I have no problem recommending Leap to a beginner. Uh, one of the claim to fame of, of, of SUSE was, and a lot of the early releases of Linux had tools to help you administer your system. So you didn't have to jump down to the command line. You had all these nice tools to help you go in and find that obscure config file that some manual was talking about that you needed to make a change to. So... And that tool is YAST. And YAST allows you to manage almost every part of your system. There's very few parts of it you can't, but uh, I'm sure that there'll be people saying, oh, no, you can manage everything. But, yeah, not quite. But you, you it's most of it, yeah. Uh, about 99% of it, I would say. YAST is a kind of a remnant from all of the early Linux distros had tools and tooling that would help you manage the systems, that has kind of gone away in a lot of the Linux distributions, but OpenSUSE continues to maintain it. I think that's a great deal for new users because you don't have to learn where every single file exists in the file system in order to make changes. You can do it all through YAST. So yeah, it, it's a great help in getting you started without having to get so deep in the mud you don't know what you were what you were trying to del what you were trying to change anymore. OpenSUSE Leap supports a wide range of hardware from x86-64. They have versions for ARM, so if you want to try it out on a Raspberry Pi, you can. Uh, there's also PowerPC support and uh, also IBM Z systems, which I doubt any of those two you would find too much in your home environment because of the cost of them, of those machines. But OpenSUSE offers documentation for startup. They also have manuals for GNOME. There's a reference guide to help you understand more about how the operating system works and some of the utilities that are available. There's a guide for security. And if you're looking to put this in an environment that is maybe on the outside of your firewall. There's also uh, system administration guides, virtualization, there's, and on and on and on. <laughs> there's a lot more. So it's very well documented, in other words. And I, that comes from their history of, of really being, you know, an early, an, early, uh, an early release. And so today, a lot of people on the Linux side seem to assume that you already know all this, right? So it's a good place, I think, for a beginner to start because, and they also have uh, a very good community of support. Uh, generally, it's very friendly. 
Although I have seen a few old sore heads in there, but you do, I mean, though, some of those guys have been using uh, uh, SUSE products for probably 30 years. What are the pros and cons? So it has a very small footprint. It doesn't take up a lot of resources or a lot of disk. Uh, the software packages are very well maintained. Uh, it's very rare in OpenSUSE to find packages that are released before they're debugged. Uh, it happens, but it's usually because somebody f forgot to test something, but it's not usually. Uh, you know, some of Linux distributions, you think you are the tester. Uh, not the ones I'm recommending to you, but uh, yeah, some of them you do. Uh, you feel like you're a guinea pig. There's a, They also offer a wide range of software packages. Some of the cons are, again, you, because of their, their, their emphasis is on stability, not trying to get the most recent package out there. If you want the latest package, go put Tumbleweed on and good luck. Don't call me when you have a problem. So software packages are often not the latest version. I'm going to talk about Ubuntu uh, desktop. It is a very popular Linux distro. Uh, some have said there are more installations of it than any other of the Linux distributions combined. Uh, what makes it a good beginner's Linux distro? It's because of its large user base. It has a massive support base from its existing users. And so they you'll find forums where you can get help. There are lots of how-to websites and a lot of people that do videos on Ubuntu-based distribution solutions and problems. So some of the pros, uh, it is the most popular of all the Linux distros. It's, it has a well-established roadmap uh, for long-term support, although sometimes their directions, I mean, quite honestly, can be quirky and a little weird, uh, and they have had to backtrack on some of their ideas over time, and you, you'll probably find that out as you use them for any length of time. So uh, it does have a beautiful version of the GNOME desktop, although if you're coming from uh, Windows or Mac OS, you're going to find that that's a bit strange in comparison to what you're coming from. So, yeah, there it does have vast application support and vast community, community support as well. Uh, the cons, it requires pretty modern hardware for good performance. So, yeah, I mean, I have tested it in its performance of its kernels. It generally does not perform as well as they think it does. Uh, yeah, a lot of people have published that it is, it is a very fast OS. I disagree with that. It is not one of the faster OSs. So it does require more effort to customize the system uh, simply because it's GNOME-based. And it has a minimum set of applications installed, so you'll have to do more digging. Their software store, uh, because of their, they have a containerized version of application managers, and so their application store is becoming more and more snaps based. There still are traditional applications there, uh, but you'll have to search for them. Their default is to install a snap. One of the things that I've, I've, I've kind of been like, why are people reviewing Kubuntu? I mean, uh, that is the KDE desktop flavor of, of Ubuntu Linux. And and I, it has a very loyal following. Uh, and many feel have helped them get started with Linux faster than any other Linux distro has. So, yeah, Kubuntu was, had a sordid history. It was uh, not... It wasn't initially maintained by uh, Canonical. It was man it was managed by Blue Systems, and Blue Systems had a lot of input into how Kubuntu was designed. So generally, and these are generalizations, if you're doing photography or graphics, and you need, of course, email and office applications, or maybe you're also uh, creating music. Uh, you'll find Kubuntu has better support for those types of applications than any other Linux distro. Again, that's my opinion. Not a fact, it's just an opinion. So for those use cases, though, Kubuntu is better known than uh, Ubuntu's desktop because they cater more to those types of application designers. Pros, it has many video and music functions built into it. It does support fractional scaling, uh, the snaps and search is better in the Discover store than the snap store that's used by Ubuntu's desktop. 
It, it seems to be better polished overall than Ubuntu's desktop. And I think it's a bit faster. Uh, yeah, in some of my measurements, it has been a bit faster than Ubuntu's desktop. Uh, also, But it has some cons, of course. The custom uh, customization options under KDE can be exhausting. I mean, if you look at the number of places where you can customize things, it, it is, it's a pretty long list. Uh, and I wish they would simplify and combine some of those, but they probably never will because somebody would complain. So, and, and the fact that some people just don't like KDE. The last one I'm going to do today is Zorin. Uh, Zorin OS, that's a good place to start if, uh, if it's your first time to Linux. Uh, Zorin offers stability, has a good user interface, and it's kind of patterned after Mac OS and Windows. It has, it has pieces kind of from both. Uh, Zorin's OS is based on Ubuntu's long-time uh, support. So you get five years of support for security and bug fixes. Uh, Zorin comes in three variations. It comes in Pro, uh, Lite, and Core. Pro version is paid and offers additional desktop customizations that aren't in the other two releases. Zorin Lite and Zorin Core are both for basic use. But Zorin Core is more for modern computers. Zorin Lite is more for low-spec computers or older machines. They they say that they support hardware that's up to 15 years old. The uh, pros of Zorin is it looks great with the themes and customizations. Uh, it's stable for the most part, and it is fast, looks great, and it is based on Ubuntu's LTS, so you get five years of support. Some of the cons are the customizations. Some of those customizations are only available in the paid version or the pro version. One, one last thing to leave you with. Um, CES, of course, just finished up last week. And at CES, a Microsoft exec just hinted that artificial intelligence will be powering the next version of Windows called Windows 12. So they, Microsoft is working with OpenAI to bring technologies such as chat GPT to Bing uh, is what he hinted at. And to do this, he said that Microsoft will need to keep the power requirements and the low while keeping the performance requirements high. So they said that AI will be their focus for Windows 12 and that they'll be improving other technologies like Skype and adding some support for Zoom. That will be AI-based. But don't worry, Windows 12 isn't coming out next year, it's, or this year even. It's slated towards the end of the decade. So, I, yeah, we think. We think that is. But if AI bothers you, you might want to be starting to push Windows aside. Uh, yeah, I can't imagine how much extra... I mean, AI can take up a lot of horsepower off your machine, so they're going to push you into larger hardware doing that. Linux isn't going that direction, at least not yet. So another reason why you might want to try Linux. With that, I hope you enjoyed this video today. If you did, please like and subscribe. Hope to see you all again in the next one, and bye for now.